Um, we, we've seen in the past and some of this with some of the understory management and that is will people run uh, you know some pigs or sheep or things like that in the orchard um, for us that's a definite no-no and I think with the new food safety rules coming down the road that's going to get looked at pretty hard and it's just from you know they don't want us even have deer and wild animals in the orchard and so I think that's going to be something that is going to probably uh, get looked at very hard going forward so if you're doing some of those things think about that that's just from a contamination thing and you know a lot of people think well how, what's it matter if there's poop or manure on the ground but you know if we're picking with with ladders you step on them with your shoes you crawl up and down the ladder your shoes are on those rungs your hands touch those rungs those type of things so that's they're coming from so if you're doing some of that kind of stuff and you're a little larger and you're going to fall fall under those FISMA rules just kind of think about some of that so I'll get going here um, a lot of this you, you kind of know from yesterday, so we'll skip this stuff. Um, so understory management, um, I think you're going to hear kind of two different um, uh, uh, versions of how to do things, which is great. It's always good. Like I said yesterday, there's not always one way of doing things. Sometimes you can combine things, um, take away different ideas, and, and that's good. Um, one of the biggest things is, you, you know, you, why to do some of this stuff. Um, you know, eliminate some potential homes for pests, insects or rodents. Um, and for us, one of the biggest ones is rodents. Uh, and then reduce competition, grass and weeds. And this is a really big uh, deal, especially in these younger trees, these high density trees. We're trying to get them pushed and grown up and fill their space really quickly. Um, com competition for water and nutrients, especially in those young trees. Um, and uh, those, those weeds and, and um, grass and things can, can be a big problem at picking time. Um, you know, we have some problems with vines. You get those vines uh, grow up in there and they can shade out a big portion of the tree in a hurry. Um, you know, and it, it, for us with, a, with the pickers, it, it makes a, a, a difficult time for picking in the fall. And if you pick your own, I'm assuming your customers don't want to come around and wait around in knee-deep grass, especially when we have a fall like we had this fall with all the rain. Um, it's kind of two different approaches with different age and different size trees. You see the younger one here on the left, you know, just getting established, filling their space versus an older established fruiting tree. Um, we kind of think about them as two different programs. Um, young trees, newly planted, um, you know, we're obviously pushing them very hard to fill their space. Uh, we need to keep the weed pressure down uh, on those um, because we don't want them competing for water, nutrients, and all that. We want to put everything we can into those young trees and get them to fill their space. Um, be real careful with herbicides. Make sure you're using, uh, reading the labels and um, following them and making sure they can go on those young trees, you know, with the, the sensitive bark. They don't have that, uh, that thick bark. You can use uh, some tree guards and things like that, but um, we're still pretty hesitant, even with a tree guard on, to use anything that we can't come back and, and put on that tree. And usually we have our herbicide on before we've, got, we've started putting our tree guards on. We're planting and then we're coming right back with herbicide just as soon as we can. Um, we don't use any Roundup anymore in our dwarf trees, none whatsoever. Um, our older trees, our semi-dwarfs, we'll, we still use some Roundup in that, um, but we've been afraid to stay away from it. There's, there's been some talk with some Roundup injury uh, in some of these trees, and we, we think we've had some and seen it, so we just, we're just not using it at all anymore. Um, like I said, put, we try and put the herbicide on as soon as we can. Um, so if you look here, these are trees that we've just planted here. Um, kind of shows you we're painting them too. And then there's the tree guard um, that we can use. And that one is, is, doesn't have any holes through it. So, um, you know, we could go and spray uh, behind those if we were using a herbicide that we were a little scared of. We just don't take the chance. Um, and the young trees, we're using uh, Prowl H2O. Uh, and forfeit on those trees um, the first uh, couple of years till they get up and fill their spaces. That's kind of se seems to be um, what what we've uh, come up with the formula. And we, we don't have it completely figured out yet either on that, but that, that's been our best bet the last couple of years. On the mature trees, um, we can be a little more tolerant of some competition in them. They obviously have a bigger root system, um, and uh, so we can, we can handle some, some weeds coming in, some grass coming in, especially as we get later in the season. Um, 
Then in the semi-dwarf, some of our bigger older trees, obviously it's a little easier because those trees get up and uh, they shade out and, and there's a significant portion of shaded ground under those trees once you get, you know, kind of into June and that. Um, so it's a little easier to manage some of that stuff. And we see a different type of weed uh, coming in and those um, usually become a little more woody as the tree gets older. You know, we're starting, you get start to get some, uh, some vines and you start to get some, uh, um, you know other brush and that type of things coming in from the wooded edge and so we typically have to, to go over and, and do some spot spraying with a different kind of herbicide then. Um, mature trees, um, we, we'd put a, uh, apply a pre-emergent in the fall. Um, we've just, the last few years we've gone to that. Springtime, everybody knows how busy the springtime is and to get the weather to cooperate for you in the springtime to get good conditions when you're driving around in there and, and not tearing everything up. Um, we've usually got so much stuff going on there. We've just found that late fall after harvest um, on our, all our mature stuff we go in there and uh, do it then and it's worked out very, very well for us. Um, we usually have to come back once or twice more during the growing season, um, depending on the amount of rain. Um, a lot of times this can get away from you late in the season. Uh, if you get a bunch of late summer rains, you know, and all of a sudden you're thinking about harvest time and getting everything going. And then, you know, you forget about that, especially some of your late season stuff. You know, those weeds get grown up in there. Um, if you're picking that stuff, you know, in October and uh, all of a sudden you got weeds that are knee high again. And for us, it's, it's a big issue with our, with our pickers. And I, I could see how it could be kind of the same thing in a pick your own. Um, so the biggest thing is, is, is once you've done that, you want to scout and, and know what you're going after and target it and make sure what you're using is going to get that. Um, it, 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 that's a big thing because it's not always the same thing um, and, and it can be different in different parts of your orchard depending on what you've got around the edge of your, of your farm. And, um, you know, so we've seen this change dramatically in the last 10 years of our target weeds. And it's just because we've changed our program. And so all of a sudden you maybe get a hole in that program and you get something that starts popping up and it doesn't take very uh, long. And you get something, a weed in there that it hasn't got any other competition and it'll take over in a, in a hurry. Um, so these tall weeds like this, you know, they, you know, they look very nice, you know, out driving around the roadside and that. Um, but uh, it, they can quickly grow up, and especially in these, these dwarf trees, and shade a significant portion of the bottom branches in there and shade your fruit. Um, it can also start to get, you know, not only color, but you can start to get some, uh, some uh, you know, sk uh, skin, fruit skin effects on that if they're in those weeds all the time. And our pickers, and, you know, pick your own again, uh, they don't like wading around in that, in that stuff. They quickly will, will uh, tell you. Um, this is much nicer to go in and harvest in the fall uh, when, when you got that. I'm sure most people are mowing their rows and that, but also, you know, for the, for the pickers, you know, they're, they're not in the rows as much as they're in, in the uh, space in, the, uh, in between the trees there, so uh, it, it, it's a lot nicer this way. Um, our two big problems for weeds, you know, once we get them controlled and they're, do our pre-emergent and what comes back in is bind weed. A lot of people sometimes call it morning glory. Uh, we've called it morning glory for years, and it's actually bindweed, um, and then thistle. Um, bindweed is a big problem in our young trees. I've seen that in a matter of a couple weeks go from the ground to have that tree completely covered. Um, and also in our big trees, you'll see it grow up in there and shade out a significant portion. Uh, one thing I'll tell you on this is we no longer, we'll send people through if we have this past summer was particularly bad and, and um, we had so much moisture they were growing and once that gets up in and gets that growing point up into that tree it's really hard to kill it if you know you're killing the bottom of it um, there's some things that won't kill it you know if, if you get it and you can cover that whole thing on the ground they'll take care of it but it's much more difficult once it gets that growing point up in the tree and when we are doing these, if we're cutting them off, you know, once they've got up in there and we've, we've sprayed them, or even if we, we're killing them, um, we no longer try and cut them off and pull them out of the tree. Um, because you do that, we've seen that in the past on little trees, they get wrapped around that leader so much, you break the leader off or you're pulling your apples out. If you cut these off, even go around by hand and cut them off, you know, just, just jerk them loose at the bottom and leave them hang there. In a matter of a couple of days, they'll dry down to nothing, and, and they won't be an issue later. So, um, you know, we were doing that before, jerking them out, and um, he's all kinds of apples on the ground, and uh, we were breaking some leaders. So, um, and a big thing with this is that they'll creep in from the, your drive roll. 
so that you can have it clean and killed in here uh, and underneath the tree and, and, the, and the drip line and that and then all of a sudden you'll see them start growing in from that drive row you know just as soon as they get that tip up in anything and then they, they're right up and gone so pay attention to that too you know if, if you're going along and spraying them and you think oh I, I got them killed you know they're, they're just brown and dead in there but watch them for creeping in um, same thing in the mature trees, you know, they get in and they'll just blanket it, you know, very, very quickly. Um, thistles, there can be several different types of thistles, um, and they pose a different challenge because even if we kill that thistle, if we wait too long and let it get up, you end up with this. And this is just as bad or worse than a, than a, you know, a healthy live thistle because nobody likes wading around in a big dead thistle because, you know, you kill that thistle and it stands there, it's still a pretty stout plant to try and walk through. So um, that's... Uh, become a real big issue for us and we, we just have to make sure that um, we get on it quickly so they're not very tall and we have to wade through that in the fall. Um, changing times though, uh, we're, we're quickly kind of thinking about um, how we've done things because um, it always used to be, you know, we used to go on these tours and, and you'd drive by other people's orchards and, and you know, they, they wanted that drip line or that they, your herbicide spot underneath the tree just as bare as could be. You wanted it to look like an asphalt parking lot. And, you know, and I think everybody kind of took pride in, you know, I have this bare. There's not a weed in there. I challenge you, go out and find a weed underneath my trees. And, uh, you know, it, it, it looked pretty cool. It looked really nice. Like we were really, you know, doing an excellent job. You know, if you got a few weeds in there, you're like, oh, you felt embarrassed. Um, and now we've kind of uh, discovered in a lot of the talk now is, is that that's not very healthy for the soil um, and to keep that down. And so we're, we're changing our ideas and changing our ways uh, on what to do. And a lot of it is, too, is, is the age of the tree and what times of the season can we take a little competition. So this old uh, burn down year long and bare and these big wide strips, um, for us, that's a, that's a thing of the past. Um, you know, f we're very hilly, and a big thing for us is erosion, especially early in the life of the tree till we get that soil, um, you know, settled back down. Um, but we have, we have a lot of problems with erosion, and this is one thing, one reason we haven't gone to, like, tilling, you know, that row or um, um, I think they call them, like, a weed badger or something like that. Um, it's really a... a <laughs> Uh, not even an option for us because we'll have we'll have such terrible erosion and such terrible problems uh, down that tree row um, and for us it it doesn't matter we go down that row even if we're planting around the hillside we're going to get washed in crossways or we're going to you know we we just we don't have any flat ground like I say if we have flat ground we built a building on it so um, so we're changing to a smaller herbicide row even this is too wide you know we used to have we had our our uh, our sprayer and um, you know we had a hooded sprayer and we'd go down and, and we used one maybe two maybe we had um, you know one width for our, our younger trees and then another width for our bigger ones and and we've not we've completely eliminated the wide one and a lot of places we're down to just one nozzle um, this is what we like to see now you know it, it does not need to be out past that drip line of the tree for sure um, and you can see even a few other weeds starting to grow in there um, but, you know, we're not worried about that as much, especially we get, you know, most of the way through the season. Um, and if they're low growing, some of those weeds we can, we can live with. Um, we just don't want anything that's going to get up tall. Uh, it's going to be a problem with the pickers or potentially, you know, creep up into the tree. Um, you know, and this is the same thing too, you know. So you see some grasses come back in there. And, and this is what we kind of like to see. Uh, in the fall, you know, there's really no reason to have it completely bare. Um, these are mature trees, they're fruiting hard, so, you know, that, that's fine. You know, we'll take care of that next spring and, and keep that competition down till after, um, you know, they've set the crop and they're growing, and uh, we, can, we can just live with this. Um, so new ideas that we're starting to really look at um, and we're really excited about is some mulching. Um, there's some, there, you know, obviously advantages, weed control, conserve moisture, disadvantages for us, cost. You know, we, we don't have a lot of big mulch, you know. We don't have places around us that would have, you know, big tonnage of mulch where we can go and pick up uh, truckloads. How do we put it on? Um, we would have to buy another piece of equipment to, to put it on the side discharge. Um, and then um, rodents. You know, so is that going to be a, a home for the mice? And that's a huge issue for us. We have uh, a lot of problems with voles and mice and worries about. The other thing, we, I just about started to do a trial with this last year. 
and we're talking about using softwood and hardwoods and some of that, things like that. The other thing that worries me a lot is this graft union. So how do I make sure when I plant my graft union and I've got that this, this distance out of the ground I want, how do I make sure that stays the same? So we're covering it up with mulch and we're trying to get enough so that we have that enough to get a weed barrier. We have enough to, you know, to get, conserve the moisture, um, but I don't get that so we bury that graft union and you know, how do I determine how far do I leave that out? And then if it settles down, then we sacrifice, it's too far out of the ground, we sacrifice the height of that tree. So this one we've not figured out. Um, we'd like to do a little playing around with it, but my biggest barrier is the rodents and the, uh, and the graft union. Um, new ideas, this one we're really excited about. We're, we're really trying to uh, figure out how, to, how we can do this is mow and blow. So we're taking all your clippings, your, your for us, we don't push the brush out, we chop the brush right in the orchard and putting the, the, the clippings back in underneath the tree. Um, and especially, um, not so much on, on, the, on the clippings for the, the prunings, but the grass. We're going by there two or three times a year anyways. Instead of blowing that back in the aisle, we can blow it under the tree it's going to give us a little bit of, you know, because we're not talking where you're not going to have, you know, maybe four or five inches in that. Even if you do on grass, it's going to, going to pack down pretty quickly and go away. We can get that organic matter back under the tree. It's going to be better for the health of the, of the soil in the long run. Um, so, but the problem for us is trying to find a mower that can do this. Um, you know, we've talked to a few people, and I've watched a lot of YouTube clips and uh, trying to get a, uh, a mower um, we'd like to try and find a, a foil mower that can do this, and there are a few out there, but none in the United States. Um, we'd like to get that and, uh, and start playing around with that. And um, labor, I mean, it's not going to cost us anything extra. It's just the mower. Um, disadvantages, I, I haven't really thought of any yet. And like I say, we're very excited to try and start doing this. Um, this is the flail mower that has it, and it's got an auger on the back, and it augers it right out uh, onto there, um, and uh, that's one I've seen on YouTube. Um, fertility. So it's the same thing here. It's kind of two different stories. Um, one, aggressively grown to fill the space as soon as possible versus your older trees. You want to kind of slow down, uh, just put enough on to, to uh, fruit and maintain the health of the tree, maintain the growth. If you're doing any of this stuff, if you've got a good um, um, man, crop advisor, crop manager in your area that can help you with a lot of this stuff, um, we're fortunate in our area now. We've just got uh, we had one of our local co-ops. Uh, they went together with several other in the area, and they, and they brought in a nutritionist that does have uh, quite a bit of knowledge in in the apples. And so we're trying to develop a program that we follow this program every year. You know, so we're doing tissue samples uh, a couple times a year, doing soil samples, um, doing soil samples before we plant, and trying to address everything then. Um, but we'd like to try and have a program where we know where we're going basically year after year with the same thing, especially in the end of the year um, when we're going in and putting on our mature stuff. Um, we'd like to try and get a, a good enough sample of our tissue samples and know um, what the changes are from early in the season to the late in the season and what we need to put on. Now, we will put some uh, foliar stuff on in between, but we'd like to get a, a pretty regular um, maintenance program going on. Um, I could say the young trees, we're pushing them as hard as we can to fill their space. This is where we've changed a considerable amount in the last 15 years, how much harder we're pushing these trees. The first few blocks of high density stuff we had, um, we were working with them and, and they were saying, you know, we want to get these blocks uh, in the, and uh, grow and fill their space in the second year or the third year and then we're on. And man, we're like, you're crazy. There is no way. You know, we're looking at five, maybe six years to get them filled in. Um, and now that we've started to more intensely manage them and uh, push them, um, we're getting most of ours up there. I mean, a lot of the stuff we're planting is Honeycrisp, so it is a little harder, but in the third year and definitely the fourth year. Um, and some of it is the new rootstocks, um, but um, it, you know, we're kind of learning. Um, and the only thing I'd tell you is it's kind of a little bit like an iceberg. So when, when you start to get those trees close to filling their space off, you want to start backing down because you don't want these trees, once you start fruiting them, you don't want to have excessive nitrogen in there. Um, pushing a tree leads to poor fruit quality. So you kind of got to learn when to start backing down on the other side. So that way you're not putting all this on and then, then you, you want to shut them down growing and crop them the next year and you've still got that residual left from the year before. And so as you, you'll kind of learn as you're doing this, um, you know, kind of when to start pulling it back. 
Um, so like these trees, this is a good example. These trees, you look at them and they're almost to the top of the wire, but they really haven't filled their space in. You know, we've got them tall. And so this is where it always gets kind of tough. Uh, do I start cropping these trees? Um, do I, uh, you know, do I start pulling back on these? And these would be the, the type of tree where we would probably give these like our half our fertilizer program for the year so we'd probably hit them the first time around in the spring um, and and hit them with some um, ground uh, applied and um, and then also um, this is area we use a lot of calcium nitrate and we hand apply it and we try and put out about a quarter of a pound every time we go by it, it's very scientific how we do it we use a handful and so I tell everybody, just kind of grab a handful, and we all, if we have new people, we all get there, and, and we put a handful, get a handful, and yep, that looks about right. And then we throw it on the ground, and we try and make a donut. You know, we don't want it in one pile. But you get pretty good. We just sit on a flatbed trailer. We get one guy driving, four guys going. We drive down the rows, and we're for high-density trees like this. Um, we go pretty fast, and you hit every, every other tree. So with two guys on, the, on there, you know, I hit one, he hits one, and, and so we get them all as we go by. But if I get stuff that's two and three year old that's not quite where I want it, especially if it's uneven, like in a lot of my bud nine blocks, we can skip trees then. So if we got a tree that, you know, we get a section of that block that's all nice and up where we need it, then we, we can just drive by and skip it. And if we don't, uh, if we want to get it to them, then, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll hit them with a little fertilizer. And like I say, we do this early. And generally, I'll hit them, uh, they're a little bigger tree, I'll hit them with two handfuls. So it's kind of nice. I get somebody on the front that kind of knows what they're doing. And so instead of skipping trees, I'll tell the guy, if I throw a handful, you throw a handful on that same tree. That way they know what I'm looking at. It works really good. You can get over a lot of trees. We can get over five, 6,000 trees in a day um, doing this. So we just usually have another guy on the trailer filling buckets and we just ride on a, ride on a uh, little uh, old apple box and a, and a pail in front of us and you just throw them down. But try and get it spread out, um, you know, about a foot circle around there. And you can get pretty good where you can get it and you can throw it and, and it'll spread right out. Um, so we, we apply several types. We use one called top wire, which is a pre-made solution. Um, we put it on with our herbicide sprayer. We don't put it on with the herbicide spray. We're doing a separate spray. Um, but um, we really like that. That's got a lot of micronutrients and things, and, and it's specifically designed for young trees. Um, like I say, a lot of calcium nitrate we like, and then a lot of foliar. Um, in our first couple of years, um, as the first year, as soon as they start to uh, um, leaf out and uh, go, then we'll, hit, we'll start hitting them with foliar, and I'll put a little foliar in every time I go by those trees. Um, we're not doing any fertigation. And that's one thing we've looked at, we would like to, but for us, um, with our heavy soils and um, the rains we get, we didn't want to try and rely on a fertigation program because there's lots of times this year that I wouldn't have dared run our, our irrigation. We were so wet as it was. So we feel we can get a consistent every year program more by doing it this way than relying on fertigation. Um, mature trees, um, obviously we want to slow down the growth, just supply what they need to support a crop and be healthy. And, um, you know, the, if you work with some uh, crop advisors, and they'll tell you, you know, you should be looking at, you know, four to six to eight inches of growth, depending on the variety. And some of it's different if they're tip bearers or versus uh, um, the others. And that one thing, fertility, do your soil testing, do your tissue testing, um, and, and do some a couple times a year on the tissue samples. You can really start to see uh, how things change, you know, if we do it in the beginning of the year, and then um, on our mature stuff, we're looking at if, if we're short on anything. Uh, typically in our area, uh, we're gonna see uh, iron um, and possibly phosphorus that we'll put on, and we can hit a couple foliar sprays um, during the, during the, f in the summer when we're doing cover sprays. But once we started doing it in the fall, we started seeing some areas where all of a sudden we really were dipping down in, and we didn't realize. And um, the, uh, it, it, so it's really helped us to kind of look at, hey, maybe we need to do something else there, uh, you know, in late August, so we make sure those apples are in, are in uh, optimum condition to come in. Um, Watch the micronutrients. You can see some things here. You know, some of those signs will come up. But if you don't know, there's a couple good apps uh, you can get on your phone that you can look that will show you these things. And so if you don't have a good crop advisory area, but you, they can bring them up and it'll show you what to look for. And there's just, there's a ton of different things. You get that all the time. People will want to come up to you and, hey, I have this on my tree. What is it? And you're like, oh boy, you know, 
that's that's it's it's hard lots of times from just looking at a, a leaf you don't know whether that's a micronutrient or that was burned by herbicide or you know several different things um, so as I was saying two different strategies mature versus young um, we look at them as almost as they're a completely separate plant um, and uh, the other one is um, times are changing you know we're, we're quickly wanting to consider the the health of the soil and the long-term uh, ramifications of what we're doing um, you know and considering environment so we um, we're part of a program now where we have um, IPM Institute of North America comes in and they certify all our growers in our group and we have a lot of, of chemicals not herbicides and uh, fungicides and insecticides that that we can't use um, because they're looking at them and and rating those things for what they uh, health concerns environmental concerns and that so it's really made us start to think about things uh, quite differently and uh, we're just kind of excited about where things to go and real excited to hear about what Michael has to say because I think it's it's gonna gonna kind of tie into what the future has so Um, we're typically doing our first one um, probably about the time of uh, between like first and second cover. Um, so we're there in, in, in June, you know, and it depends on, you know, everybody knows the first cover has changed three weeks in the last few years. But that's kind of when we start to, to go by it. We don't have a set date, but kind of in that stage in there. And we're looking at it then because that allows us by the time that gets back those those results get back and we can plan and we that gives us uh, you know some cover sprays in there to address anything and typically what we're seeing then um, is iron um, magnesium boron that we're putting on at those times of year and we're obviously doing a lot of calcium sprays you know um, I think most people are if you're doing especially if you've got a lot of honey crisp um, on our on our honey crisp we're typically doing foliars um, uh, trying to get 12 to 15 pounds on so we're looking at um, you know 10 to 12 sprays um, we're going in there and putting that on um, but um, you know so that gives us some time to to work them in so we don't necessarily have to go back and do specific foliar um, sprays you know we can put them cover spray and now the last couple of years we started to doing you know we had some some issues in some honey crisp um, and and some other things as far as storage and we, we we're trying to figure out you know why you know with everything we put on them and we started doing some late ones um, in um, like late August early September on some of these varieties and it was really interesting because um, we were seeing some of the same issues of micronutrients but we were seeing other issues that weren't and we were thinking uh, we're going to be you know low on calcium we weren't we were very rarely where we were low on calcium it was some of these other issues or other uh, nutrients that we were low on and so now we're trying to say okay where do we need to go and you know sometime in August to get that on um, and you know and calcium not is not just a honey crisp issue but on a lot of other apples if you can get that in there um, before you pick them if you're going to try and store them long term you, you'll really increase your storage ability uh, if you get that on but it's a it's a for those of us, if you're going to put like uh, just two or three um, calcium sprays on it, it's a timing issue when you get that on them at the correct time to get the most bang for your buck. So, if, if I might, mm -hmm. so, so your first one in, in around the time of first cover in mm -hmm. June is primarily for micronutrients. Yes. Okay. And the second one is too. Um, it can, it, you know, we're just, what we're doing with that second one is the first time we did it, we were trying to find out you know what what we were missing where we were going wrong and when we got it back it it wasn't you know we figured it'd be the same ones you know we put we didn't put enough on or we put it on and now it's gone and it wasn't um, and so the, as part of our whole th um, idea we wanted to get a season-long program where we look at and we say okay you know this time of year we do this and this and that's where we started to incorporate this this two tissues uh, sample testing so we say okay every year we're going to test here and we're going to test here and from there we can make adjustments but we wanted to make a baseline program that okay so from seeing what we're we've been doing this is where we have our holes and this is where we need to address them and so by doing that and we're f hoping that as we go down the years if we keep doing this that maybe we can eliminate some of these ones especially the later ones um, once we get the issues addressed if we can get them up 
Uh, we don't know, we haven't done it long enough to see if that's going to be a continual problem at that time of the year, and we always have to put those nurturings on then or not. But it was really an eye-opener for us when we started doing that, that second one. No, we're doing leaf. Yep, yep. And it's another thing. You can do it yourself, and there's a lot of places to go in and send them in. We do do some apple ones. Part of our um, that uh, grower group that in with pizzazz, um, we have been pulling um, apples. Um, we're pulling them when they're about the size of a golf ball and sending them in, and they're doing nutrient samples on that. And a lot of that has to do with we're trying to look at um, that uh, the nutrients in the apple as far as for storage ability uh, down the road. So um, we've been doing that on that, but we've only done that in pizzazz. We haven't done it on our other 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 apples yet um, you can like I say you can do it yourself and send them in or a lot of times if you're working with a crop advisor they can do that with you and then they can get them back and the nice thing is is um, you know they'll have recommendations and a lot of times they'll have recommendation for a product um, to, to help you to use that Um, I'm sure there are, but uh, you know the the biggest one the last few years has been Honeycrisp. There's been a lot of work done on Honeycrisp on on that, um, and and some of those um, you know they're out there. They've been done by universities. A lot of work's been done by by private grower groups. So I don't know how readily available some of those are, but um, uh, that's a that's a good question. I've not seen it, but I would assume that you, you probably start talking, especially you start uh, getting into some of the Michigan State and Washington State stuff that there's some of that out there. I don't know if you'll get down specific for each variety, but you know, a lot of these varieties, you know, they're, especially the newer ones are, are uh, um, you know, offshoots or crosses between other things. And, and some of those things will, you know, they kind of apply broadly. Um, others they don't, you know, like with uh, Bitter Pit with Honeycrisp, most of the new Honeycrisp varieties um, and offshoots have that same bitter print internal browning and stuff like that but there's a few of them that don't you know it's kind of genetic thing you know what what good traits and what bad traits they got but um i've not ever just seen like a blank you know like just a you'll see a chart for um you know storage things you know and all and this i've never seen a chart with all that on there that'd be an incredibly useful thing i don't know if anybody there's a lot that goes into it though that that could be a pretty big chart um, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to. And, and that's one thing where I would say that, you know, that you know, your charter growing it, from, from area to area and even on our farm uh, down the row, it's going to change dramatically. So there's nearly not a, a, a silver bullet, one thing does all. You've really got to tailor it. And we'll see it on our farm from end at one end to another when we're doing these tissue samples and soil samples. One area will be fine, other area will be way low on something. Um, and, you know, they've basically been treated the same. And, and so you'll see that, and we see that all the time in our group, and, um, you know, we're doing a lot of that sampling for looking for at the calcium levels and that, and it's always, you know, the, when they, they put them all up on the, we have our meetings and put them all up on the board, and, you know, the, the guy that's got the top levels of calcium, you know, it's like, stand up and get your door prize, you know, you want. And so, but it, it is, um, it, it varies greatly uh, on what you have. Um, Um, regalia, I, I don't know anything about, and we've not done any sap testing, so I'm not going to be very much help for either of you. Sorry. How much time do I have? Uh, Keep going? Okay. Uh, no, we'll do a little burn down then too, on our, especially on our old trees and our younger trees. Um, we're a little more hesitant on what we're doing there, but yeah, we're we're putting a burn down with it then. You know, because then you also you've you've it's a lot easier. You know, your trees are kind of more dormant and, they, and the bark's hardened off a little more. We're very cautious early in the year on anything on the growing, but in the fall we are putting a burn down with it. Yep. Yep. 
as late as we possibly can. Uh, it changes from year to year depending on you know what, what kind of moisture we've had in that. Um, but um, whenever we start to come back in the second time, um, it, it's typically on, on our, our high density stuff, it's, it's grasses and things like that. There's just so much more sun gets in there. On our older trees, um, it's, it's not, well, we're just going to load this up and go because um, it's always we're after specific things. And um, my brother-in-law does 99% of the herbicide work, and it drives him crazy because you go on the young high-density stuff, you can kind of mix up and go. And on the older stuff, we might mix up five different blends of stuff depending on what we're looking at. And he, he might go down the row and he'll have that herbicide, uh, you know, on, off, on, off, you know, especially on a lot of this stuff. Thistles is a big one. You know, very rarely do you see a great big whole row full of thistles. They'll be in spots. Um, uh, bindweeds usually, you know, pretty consistent down through there. Um, but other things, you know, and, and we get in our older orchard some brambles or things like that. Um, it's the same thing. It's usually a more spot spraying going on there. So we're always uh, scouting um, on, on everything before we spray so we make sure we know we're, we're addressing what is actually there. Um, it's much more uh, an issue in the older stuff because it's a gamut of whatever could be there changes from year to year. Yeah. What's been effective for you guys on bindweed? Um, we are using, I'm trying to remember, we're using bindweed and thistle. Um, we are using um, aim for one and um, Oh, I'm trying to remember on the other one slips my mind. But if I think about, it, I'll tell you. I I know we. Um, I'm thinking we're using um, we're using aim for um, the bindweed and stinger for thistle. Um, that that's worked very. Stinger has worked extremely well for us on thistle. Yep, it can be a real bugger. Uh, yeah, we, we have about five different kinds of thistles that come in. Canada thistle, yeah. Um, and we've got another little one, and, and the name of it escapes me. Um, it's, um, it's not as big as Canada thistle. It's kind of tall and skinny and has a narrower um, uh, leaf than what it does. Um, and that has been the worst one for us because that gets really tall really quick. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, you just kind of made it angry, yeah. Yeah, we see that same thing too, um, and it's just a kind of depends on the year and the rainfall on some of those things. And, and this, a lot of times, we see it worse on dry years, and I think maybe because it can outcompete the other stuff, um, and, and, and it's a real bugger. Um, you know, and some of us, for the program we have, there's a lot of herbicides that aren't available for us to use. Um, and so sometimes it's just, it's a battle, and you just have to keep going out and going after it. And, and it changes, but typically we see our thistles starting to come in kind of uh, in that July period. You know, we've killed that other stuff down. Um, it, it's not great growing conditions, you know, for, for that. You know, it's just like your lawn. You think about your lawn grows really great in the spring, and then you get a little drier and hotter. And, that, and that's when some of those other weeds kind of take over. Um, yeah, we do, and we've changed that a, a couple times in the last year, so I'd be hesitant to tell you what we're using in it now. But um, we always know, you know, that's where you want to have a good crop consultant, and, and the product you're using, make sure you're, you're using what they recommend. Um, it's the same thing for herbicides and things like that. Um, they, you know, they're different. Your different soil types and things like that are different rates and amounts, and that's why I'm always hesitant to, to say this is what we use, this amounts we use. And that's where you need a good crop consultant to tell you what's the best to use with that product. Um, you'll see that in a lot of other sprays. So, be, you know, that's one type of thing. If you're going out and you don't have an knowledge and you're doing research, when you get using those things, get a crop consultant that, that is knowledgeable about that product and can tell you the best way to use it. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. Um, the Plantra ones, they're, um, we're thinking we can get about six years out of them. 
six to seven to maybe eight depends on them we've had some batches that didn't last quite as long and others that that have seemed to hold up real well um, so you could possibly do that and and um, get away with that um, the new uh, tree guard we're going to is more of a corrugated plastic so it's got holes in it um, and I think that's going to hold up longer so that's a very good point we probably could get by with it um, the other thing for us is the um, you know the re availability of mulch in our area um, and so um, we would it always worries me if we get those rodents in and we get really really heavy snow um, if you know, we, they get up above them. I have seen them where we get heavy, crusty snow, and then they're, they're up above things. So I'm always hesitant to give them any advantage in the orchard. I saw I was at a, a, a big one in Washington, and he used no mouse bait. Um, if you're using mouse bait and things like that, you know, if you're trying to um, put, like, hawk houses and things like that, you've got to be real careful because you don't want to put mouse bait out, and the mouse die and the hawks get to them. So you got to make sure your program's all mesh. But he didn't use any bait. He didn't use anything. All he used was mouse traps. And this guy had a 2,000 acre orchard and he put mouse traps throughout the whole entire orchard. He bought pallets of mice traps and he put them out every fall. And his theory was if I don't see them dead, they're not dead. So, you know, there's lots of other ideas, but uh, mice are one thing I have very little tolerance for. I noticed that you opened the hard cider yesterday, that you couldn't wait for the guy from New Hampshire to get here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Phillips, and I live up in northern New Hampshire. We're about 30 miles from Quebec. And as I get into this, describing my farm, um, what Steve was just telling you, you know, I have a much smaller orchard. I have about three acres of orchard. Uh, my goal is to grow apples for the communities where I live. So I'm not trying to hit the wholesale market, and, and we do other things on our farm. The, the biggest other thing is medicinal herbs. The real distinction between where I'm going to go now and what Steve just showed you, I think, it's, it's not so much that idea of an organic chemical divide as the bigger freestanding tree, the dwarf tree, and the requirements of those trees. So as I get into this, um, I'm hearing this ringing. Is yeah, it ringing a lot? Just texted somebody about that, but it might be because I. It could be just me too being too, tall. too close, too tall. I'm too tall. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> um, so let's just start with this notion of what makes for a healthy plant. So what you see on this slide is a lot of what John Kempf has put out there. John Kempf is a young Amishman who has a company advancing eco-agriculture in Ohio. And the, the idea here is that plant metabolism starts with photosynthesis, goes on to protein synthesis. A healthy plant is going to produce fatty acid compounds, lipids. That's how the plant stores energy. And if this process goes all the way, the plant gets to the place where it starts producing what I call resistance metabolites. This is the way the plant resists disease. So I want this in my apple trees and my fruit trees because we have to do a lot of battling against insects and pests. And, and the main point I want to make here is that this whole process can be sluggish or it can be robust. It can be three to four times more robust than a sluggish plant. A lot of that has to do with mineralization. So I'll weave a little of that into what I talk about today, but that comes up under more foliar spraying and all that. The translation of that is when there are soluble amino acids in the plant sap, that's what apple scab disease feeds off. That's what cedar apple rust feeds off of. That's what insects like aphids and moths, moth larvae, feed off of. And if the metabolism is robust, you have a whole lot less of that in the sap because complete proteins have been made. Um, another part of what my system entails is extreme diversity, the different plants growing out there in the orchard because that's the habitat for all kinds of beneficial insects. But I'm also going to weave in another thread here. It's not just about what we see above ground, it's about what's going down below with those different plants networking 
by means of the mycorrhizal fungi. So that's a really important piece. Um, this whole idea of tree immune function, that through their phytochemistry, plants resist disease. The fungi play a role there. And another part that's really important, and we're not going to get into it today so much, but I just want to plant the seed, is that the microbes on the surface of the plant are one of the plant's primary defenses against those fungal pathogens getting, making their way in. And that arboreal biology is something I replenish in my holistic sprays, but it's, it's also something that springs from an active biology in the soil below. So all these things are interconnected. It's, it's the basis of where what I'm going to talk about comes from. You know, it takes a little bit of apple scab for the plant, the apple tree to react to that and build up its phytochemistry. When I talk about foliar elicitors, I'm referring to what I do with holistic sprays. But the part I want to concentrate now on is this idea of reserve energy. So when I use those words sluggish and robust, there's things that the soil biology does to contribute it to, to that kind of choice, how well metabolism is going. And a, a fungal dominated soil ecosystem does it much better than a bacterial dominated soil ecosystem. So that in turn leads to me wanting to do things that favor the fungi. The bacteria are important too, but I want to definitely favor the fungi. Now this is a picture my friends Chris and Michelle McColl of Kalangadu Orchard in South Australia. They live in a place where there's a lot of straw available. It's a wheat growing region. And they grow trees on dwarfing rootstocks. And they've had to deal a lot with scab and making far more sulfur and lime sulfur sprays than they wanted to. And they mulched their trees with straw, which was readily available. It made a lot of sense. But it wasn't diverse enough. They needed more of a woodsy component. So I'm just introducing a few thoughts here. So when the, uh, the term understory management is used, I changed that. I call it fungal duff management because I want to favor the fungi. I want to be thinking about the fungi all the time. And when we start to look at orchard systems, the size of the tree you're growing, how close things are spaced, how you're managing that, um, I look at that zone underneath the tree and maybe a foot or two beyond the drip line. I want to manage that area fungally. The aisle way, where I drive the tractor, soil gets more compacted, I mow more often. That's not as fungal. It, there's going to be fungal overtones, but it, it's, it's a different zone. So underneath the tree, for me, wants to be managed as a fungal duff. And one of the ways I get there is thinking about, well, just asking that question, where does an apple tree want to grow? And it really has to do with this progression of how soils recover. So a compacted soil, a monocropped cornfield, you can think of many scenarios, are, are, are pretty much a bacterial dominated place. And as the landscape is let go and goes more wild, perennial weeds come on the scene, um, succession species of trees come on the scene, there starts to be more organic matter, well that's what feeds the fungi. There starts to be organic matter with more lignans, that what really feeds the fungi. And by the time you get into the old growth forest, the fungal biomass can be 100 times greater than the bacterial biomass. But it's on the edge of the forest where the fungal biomass is about 10 times greater than the bacterial biomass. That's what I want to emulate in the soils where I plant fruit trees. So I, I don't literally mean you plant an orchard on the edge of the forest. I mean you bring the soil ecosystem found there underneath your fruit, fruit trees. Now this is a picture of my daughter Gracie. This is what's known as a photo op. When you, when you write a book and you need a picture of like the mowing machine that you mostly use in your orchard, this is a BCS with a brush mower attachment. Well, you can't take the picture and stand behind the mower at the same time. So you invite your daughter who has never ever mowed anything in the orchard. <laughs> <laughs> this machine is not running. And, and you take about 60, 70 pictures so she can choose one where she looks really cool. 
It has nothing to do with forest edge ecology, but it has a lot to do with daughters, <laughs> my daughter. So, so this question of what is the right soil biology, it's defined by that forest edge. Just think about what goes on in the forest edge. What, what are the diversity of plants there? Things fall over, raspberry canes decay. It'll, it'll start stirring some thoughts about what might I be doing underneath my fruit trees. Now, I'm going to be talking <coughs> later today in the keynote about mycorrhizal fungi, and we'll, we'll go a lot more into that then. Um, and tomorrow I'll do a question and answer session and go even further with that. But let me introduce this concept. This is my, uh, show you my amazing ability to transform. I'm an apple tree. And I don't care if you want to see me as a dwarf apple tree right now or a big old seedling. I'm an apple tree. And you see my canopy. You see my drip line. <laughs> and beneath, down in the ground, my roots extend essentially about two and a half times around where you see my, my canopy spacing. So a dwarf tree, it's a smaller circle. A bigger tree, it's a bigger circle. But in that ground, my roots with that two and a half time reach, they only actually occupy about 3% of that soil volume. And a root in and of itself takes up nutrients by the fact that primarily by the fact that groundwater brings dissolved soluble ions within, let's say, a half inch, three quarters of an inch to that root where it can be absorbed by the root. 3% of the soil volume, you can see how nutrient depletion zones quickly come into play. You know, and, and tissue testing and, and knowing you need more magnesium, that's involved with this. Now when I have mycorrhizal fungi affiliated with my root system, instead of just three quarters of an inch around my feeder roots, I now have endomycorrhizae whose mycelium extend about six to eight inches around each feeder root. So I'm, I'm accessing a lot more soil volume. Then it gets even better because when you have a diversity of plants, you will have many, many different species of fungi, some of which tie into the same plant, and now it forms a common mycorrhizal network. And now rather than just accessing nutrients in this two and a half times circle, I'm tapping into nutrients that might come from over there or way back there. Maybe you all have the zinc, but it's gonna be spread by the fungi and through the roots. So it's a really important piece of how do plants get their nutrients. And it really is keyed right to the fungi. So in any given healthy, diverse ecosystem, there's gonna be as many as 50 different species of mycorrhizal fungi. This particular picture is a bare root apple tree, um, and I am dipping it in a mycorrhizal inoculum, which has nine different strains of fungal spores, essentially to launch the fungal ecosystem that I wanna get going with that apple tree. You know, I, I've almost stopped using the phrase planting a tree, and I refer to it as launching a fungal ecosystem. You know, it's just my head is right down there with the fungi. You're gonna see some parallels to what Steve does in the timing of things as I describe what's going on with fruit trees in terms of their root growth. And when I talk root growth, I'm actually talking in terms of the reaching out of the fungal network. Winter time, things go dormant. As buds start to swell in the spring and the snow melts, you will hopefully see that no voles got your bark and they often do get in over those tree guards. I've seen that much too often. And the buds pop, and all that growth that's occurring in early spring is based on nutrients that were taken up the previous fall. And down below in the soil, things are cold. It's a sleepy place. The feeder roots are not popping up out yet off the permanent root system. The fungal dynamic is, is lying dormant as well. You go into pink approaching bloom time, and you'll notice that shoots are starting to elongate a little bit on the new growth. You might get see three, four, five inches of, of shoot growth, and the grass is starting to grow. It's getting like six inches tall, but down beneath, 
The root system is still lying low. Maybe there's a little bit of pushing now of feeder roots coming off the permanent root system. Bloom time happens, the pollinators come around, and something shifts because down below, the feeder root, what I call a spring feeder root flush, begins. And these feeder roots are going to take nutrients up over the course of the next two to four weeks. Next two to four weeks, which is going to be used to grow that year's crop and also to form flower cells for next year's crop. So right now I'm talking about pome fruits, apples and pears. Um, stone fruits are a little bit different, but they have, this, they have a spring feeder root flush as well but they're gonna form their flower buds a little later in the season. It's during that time that you'll notice that that shoot growth growing into, going into bloom stops advancing. And when things stop up top, that's because the tree is directing its photosynthates, so those carbon sugars, down into the roots to trade with the biology. And it's because at that point when those feeder roots are flushing out, that the mycorrhizal system is also reaching out. And so the tree knows, put the carbon currency down below because I wanna get that fungal element to give me all that it can in terms of nutrients. Fruit sets, somewhere between second and third cover. I'm glad to hear you use those words. I, I rarely hear cover in the East. <laughs> um, you'll notice that shoots start growing again. This is actually a hard thing to notice, but they start growing again. And that's because down below, 90% of those feeder roots have sloughed off. A few become permanent roots, but the, the mycorrhizal network as well retracts. There's an ebb and a flow to this. So when there's action above, it's not happening below. And when I talk about mowing, I really am tuned into the fact that I want to pulse the plant energy of the understory into the fruit trees. So that's born out of this kind of cycle that I'm showing here. Um, so spring feeder root flush ends. We come into summer, shoots are growing. If you're doing anything to disturb the soil or to plant a cover crop in the middle of summer, if that's part of your system, and I'll show you a slide why that might be, this is the time to do it because the feeder roots have retracted and the fungi have retracted. So with, with very shallow soil cultivation, you're not disturbing things to the same degree you would have if you did it in those two to four weeks of the spring feeder root flush. We come into August, somewhere between middle and end of August, the terminal bud sets. So we're thinking different now, we're thinking in a new way. The terminal bud set means the shoots are no longer growing. That tells you something. It tells you that something big is happening down below in the soil because now the energy of the photosynthates are being sent down to the biology. This is the beginning of the fall feeder root flush and this is a nutrient uptake period where the trees take in nutrients for 10, 12, 14, 16 weeks even under snow cover until things finally totally freeze and those are the nutrients that are going to be put in the bark into the cambium to drive next spring's bud growth. So knowing that fall is a really key time for nutrient uptake, when I talk about spreading compost, it's, it's related to doing it post-harvest, in part because of the fall feeder root flush, but also because I wanna make sure I get as many as this year's leaves decomposed as I can. I want more biological activity down there under the ground. So we all make choices in our growing system. This is an interesting thing, this slide, to, to be aware of. So this, this picture, the, the plant cover is draw, drawn much closer to the trunk than, than I keep it. But in a meadow ecosystem with a diversity of plants and lots of tap-rooted plants, and particularly plants that have big leaves that cover more of the ground than their root system takes up, there's plenty of room in the humus for apple roots be up there in those top several inches of ground to be picking up their nutrients for the fungal element to be working full bore. On the other side of this picture, it shows a regularly mown grass cover. Now all roots respire carbon dioxide. 
So in that meadow ecosystem I'm describing, that tap-rooted ecosystem, I have no issue as an apple root reaching in there. But in the case of a regularly mown grass situation, mowing makes the grass up top get denser and thicker. That's the definition of the lawn. It in turn makes for a denser and thicker root system per cubic foot of soil volume, 20 times more dense. That root system gives levels of carbon dioxide 20 times higher. And the result of that is that more of the roots that would seek the optimal nutrition in those top several inches of soil go deeper down. So the, the tree grows, it just doesn't have full access to the bacterial metabolites and the action of the fungal system that it would if it was up in those top several inches. You know, so, yeah. So for me, my mowing consists of, of kind of, I'll call it three stages. There is bloom time coming into petal fall a week or so after that whole period of the spring feeder root flush where I go out with a sigh and I mow around the trees, pull some things out, pull some things back to leave the mulch as kind of a, a canopy ring line mulch around the tree. I'm doing that in part because when I shock those plants with a single mowing, their root systems retract just as my fruit trees with the mycorrhizal fungi are seeking more nutrients. Now, you know, in a larger scale orchard, this could be a side mounted sickle bar. It doesn't have to be a side. The side is actually good for me. This is when I <laughs> get a little bit back more in shape. Um, but, it, but it's all tied to what the tree is doing. What, what are the cycles of the tree? I go on into the summer and I, with that BCS mower, keep the aisles more open. I will hit spots where something like ladies' bed straw is growing too thick for my taste and I want to push it back a little bit. Or, or there's some bindweed, so I'll hit spots like that. Um, I'll also go under trees where I know there's going to be more of a drop with earlier varieties. But I'm mostly not going under the trees because at first sighing, laying a mulch, suppress that growth. And, and, with, and remember, I'm growing bigger trees. Freestanding tree, there's more shade underneath that canopy that also helps suppress some of that growth. And then in the fall, I totally clean it up. I mow everything practically. And part of that is to reduce vole cover. Part of that is to chop up leaves because then there'll be less leaves to carry forward into the next year, which are going to be the source of the apple scab disease. So another piece of fungal duff management is providing fungal foods. And fungal foods, um, this really flows from how the fertility of soils in the east came about. It's different than the, gr the Great Plains, the prairies. In the east, it was forest derived. And I want to emulate that, but I just want to jumpstart it. And the, the method that I, the way I do that is by chipping the small portion of brushy trees, shrubs, sometimes not even chipping. This is what's known as ramial chipped wood. So this was research done at Laval University in Quebec in the 70s and the 80s. And the researchers were, were looking at what can we do with the tops of trees left from logging jobs for agricultural purpose? How can, how can we jumpstart that humification process? And th they learned two things. One was that wood two and a half inches in diameter or smaller contains a lot more cambium, the inner green bark, than the bigger wood. So the bigger wood we have purposes for, be it fence po posts or lumber or firewood. But the little wood, with that cambium, 75% of the tree's minerals are stored in that smaller portion. Then another thing they learned was that hardwood species, deciduous species, are broken down by what are called the white decomposition rot fungi, um, where softwood species are broken down by the brown rot fungi. And both types of wood chips are good, but softwood in that first nine, 12 months in being dominated by the brown rot fungi 
One of the things that's given off are aleopathic compounds that inhibit the growth of deciduous trees. And that's particularly relevant if you have young trees or dwarf trees. If you put all that fresh softwood, you're going to actually inhibit their growth because the fungi that are decomposing that wood are going to do that. That doesn't mean that the softwood can't be composted, can't be used in the blueberry patch, can't be used as bedding in the barn, which is eventually composted. There, there's ways to, to utilize that. But if it's 20% if it's more softwood derived, you want to be aware of that. Hardwood is ideal because this is where the white rots produce humic substances, which is the kind of the, the gem of what underlies long-term fertility. So where do you get, go ahead. No, take the distinguish, distinguishing factor to be more the deciduous aspect. And, and we're going to come into those soft hardwoods. I'm going to have something to say about that in a minute. Um, in fact, here. <laughs> I'm going to teach you something about things like soft maple, alder, and popple. But right now, I'll just start with the idea that I have planted apples. You know, my, my, my farm is not an ideal apple ground. It's not the upper portion of the slope, it's down more at the bottom of the slope. It's, it's not what you, it's what a 20 year old would choose who hasn't read enough books yet. Um, and, and that's where we are and that's okay. But I have significant wet ground where alders and willow grow. And when I coppice those trees and knock it back, that's a great in-house source of wood. Um, when you prune the orchard, you're taking typically smaller branches off of deciduous trees. So to prune and, and flail chop, and whether you drop that in the aisle or you have that was an amazing machine, I have to learn more. Push it into the fungal duff zone, as I'm describing it, that's great. You, know, you don't have to chip everything. If, if you're a home orchardist and you have straight shoots that are two, three, four feet long and they're laying flat, You've achieved what you need to do. You got it down to the soil line. If branches are really crooked and, and sticking up and it's more of a brush pile, then it's broken down by different fungi and different issues come up. But when you get it to the soil line, that's a positive. You get to know the people that trim the trees under power lines and along roads. You'll, you'll get into bidding wars if two of you are from the same area and you give one brand of beer and the, you give a better brand of beer because you want that pile of chips dumped at your place so that you can utilize it. I take this Ramiel chipped wood and I try to get a tractor bucket each season out around the tree. I'm, I'm not trying to mulch the tree completely. It's just hither and thither. I like different stages of decomposition going on. Um, those dumpings I'll spread somewhat, but they're, they're left typically four to six, maybe even as much as eight inches if it's a low spot thick. I find that the voles, and we have the metal vole, I don't have the pine vole. Do you have the pine vole? We're all, anyone who doesn't have the pine vole, you're very lucky. <laughs> um, they don't like wood chips. So I, I do not find that this is habitat for voles. Um, when I go to prepare ground, sometimes I do a cover crop thing if I'm getting rid of crack, quack grass. But if, if the meadow that I want to plant in is, doesn't have an, a problematic plant in it, I just simply do sheet mulching with a bucket load of wood chips. And I might throw some compost or some minerals, azomite clay, underneath there. I'm going to be working that soil in different ways. But this is another way for me with a freestanding tree, you know, in my case, a lot of what I utilize for rootstock is MM111 and Bud118, and the spacing is 15, 16 feet apart. So that makes sense. When trees start to get to be two, three, four feet apart, you want that cultivated strip because you're, you're practically planting elbow to elbow right from the get-go. Now this is an interesting picture. So. I have this wood mulch that I slide away and plant a tree, launch that fungal ecosystem. I come in, 
maybe that same year, maybe two years later, I dump another pile of chips on the other side. I do want to keep the ground around a young tree open because you do want to grow wood. But I also have learned to recognize I don't want that young tree to be cut off from the mycorrhizal network because it's surrounded with four feet of wood chips for the first several years of its life before its roots get out there to meet others. So I've learned to leave some plants closer, not like right up against the trunk, but I'm building a common mycorrhizal network in this orchard. I'm not just planting a tree, I'm joining things together. So that's just something to think about. I'll talk a little bit about, about uh, different plant allies that I like, but one of the, the superstars for me is a plant called comfrey. So again, keep in mind, I'm talking about a bigger freestanding tree. Comfrey is a broad leaved plant with a vast root system that there's plenty of room for apple roots, fruit tree roots to work around, but that broad leaf cover covers more ground than the roots occupy, and that's why there's more room in the humus. Um, and it isn't like I'm coming in and have this massive amount to sigh every year. Um, this is what this picture is about, giving you this idea that it's different under there. There's more shade, there's bigger leaf plants, and comfrey I'm gonna let bloom because that's where the bumblebees go right after the uh, apple bloom ends. So in working in a more high density system, um, I realized I should have put quotes around the low cost of synthetic inputs because I know they're very expensive. <laughs> um, but if, if you're not using the herbicides, then you're doing it more with labor. And labor, whether it's mulching or you get one of those weed badgers or there's the guy in Michigan, who the welder, Phil Brown, and that he is something called the wonder weeder. But there it's, it's shallow cultivation with some sort of tine, tine implement that's disturbing the top inch or so of the soil, which is a, I, I use the term biological compromise. It's not the ideal for the fungal thing, element, but it's what you need to do to work with more dwarfing rootstock if that's the direction you wanna go. And as long as you just understand it from that, through that, fungal lens, it's, it's okay. I mean, we make choices how we figure out to do what we're gonna do to pay our mortgage and hopefully have money in the bank at the end of the year and et cetera. So here's a picture of my orchard. You probably wouldn't know that I have a degree in civil engineering from Penn State. You would think my, my tree rows would be really straight. <laughs> but, but this is loose and wild out there. Uh, this is following bloom, and so the trees, there's some white coating, that's the surround kale and clay, which is what I'm utilizing to ward off plum cuculea. Compost is a big part of this. So there is garden compost, and there is orchard compost. Another way of saying that is there's bacterial compost, and there is fungal compost. When a pile is turned five times in the first 30 days, if you're organic certified, you are definitely generating a lot of heat and it's a bacterial compost. Um, an orchard compost is gonna have a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio and it's not going to be turned because you wanna specifically get all kinds of microorganisms thriving in that compost. So when we make um, compost for the garden, I do a partially static method. This is my wife, Nancy. This was also a photo op, but she actually does some of this stuff. <laughs> um, and, and the resulting compost, I'll use half of it in the garden, but the other half I'll take and I'll mix with equal buckets of ramiel chip wood. Sometimes it's more of the softwood type stuff. And that's going to sit anywhere from 6 to 12 months. It's somewhere near where the orchard, usually on the edge of the orchard, doesn't have to be on the edge of the forest. Um, when I spray my orchard with holistic sprays, the nutrients, it includes fatty acids from neem oil and karanja, and if we were talking about that, I could come up with other sources as well. I mean, this, this is just a, a wild concept. <laughs> we're, we spray maybe sometimes for foliar nutrition. We spray for a specific pest or to ward off a disease, so we spray the foliage. That same mix, I spray my compost piles, why? because fatty acids feed the fungi. And similarly, out there in my orchard, when the sprays drip to the ground, fatty acids feed the fungi. So in our area, they're doing a lot of uh, the large areas, 
place. They're doing a lot of projects with digesters and compost and stuff like that. So, you know, we've thought about doing some of that compost. And is that the, the right kind of compost, or is that? So if typically a compost operation has those big windrow turners, and they're generating the heat and the bacteria, that compost could be mixed with the wood chips and let, let sit. Typically, a compost operation doesn't give you that. There, there are some, but most are just kind of focused on that quicker turnover and getting it out there. So that could be utilized, but to mix it with wood chips. And, and here's the key. Compost is not just about returning nutrients. It's m actually more about increasing the diversity of organisms in your soil wherever you're growing whatever crop that you're growing. And with the fungal compost, the orchard compost, it, even compost that's mature, which is what you'd be getting from these operations, you know, the diversity of organisms is going to continue to increase for six months for sure, if not 12 months. And so it all fits together in terms of not just more fungi, but more bacteria, more nematodes, more protozoa. It, it's all to the good. You know, in returning the harvest, um, talked about how fall re feeder root flush is taking place. I do it in late fall after the harvest. I might start, so you know, early apples and I have some time, maybe I start sooner, but it isn't a whole lot. It, it takes like one plus cubic foot of compost on trees that I've allotted a 15 to 16 foot radius. That, that's like one and a half five gallon buckets. That's like you got your tractor bucket and six or eight shovelfuls. And it isn't like you're, you're not thinking like a gardener. You're, you're simply spreading diversity. You're getting on top of fallen leaves so they decompose better. But that's the timing based on what the roots are doing. So then in addition, there are other things people do that are totally about the fungi. So one of those concepts is wood-based fertility through what's called hugo culture. And th this is the burying of woodsy debris. Now, this is a trench, and people do this to make raised mounds for garden plantings. What I typically, how I typically utilize hugo culture is often on a slope. And in the upper picture, that's for like California, where the land is dry, moisture running down, goes into the trench, which helped build the terrace. The trench is filled with chipped wood or branches covered with chipped wood or covered with hay. It becomes a, a place for moisture to be stored. On the other scenario, downhill, the woodsy debris has been buried at the base of the terrace, and soil taken to create that terrace covers it. That, that's the key to hugo culture. It's not just a pile of brush. It's covered with either soil or compost or rotting hay. So th there's different ways you can go about that. Another cool thing is understanding who operates biochar. And biochar, carbonized wood, um, black carbon, is basically a rechargeable battery in a soil ecosystem. So a rechargeable battery, by that I mean the fact that nutrient elements are attracted to the charged spaces and held there to be taken up by the plant we think, but it's not the plant. It's the mycorrhizal fungi that unlock the rechargeable battery. This is a picture of a bean root, and over there in that corner are the root hairs off the bean root. All of that is big and blunt. Over here is the particle of biochar, and those fine crystalline porous spaces can only be accessed by those fine hyphae, which are the mycorrhizal fungi, reaching in there and getting the benefit of the rechargeable battery. I do not make my own biochar other than sifting embers from wood fires in our house. Um, but when I plant a tree, I try to put a pound or so of biochar in that planting hole and in that environs. If, if you have more access to biochar, you might use it in an even more generous way. But I'm basically just putting a rechargeable battery in there for the fungi. Um, that's going to be working for a long, long time. Another part of the fertility loop are the plants that we grow. So when I mentioned comfrey with this big root system, 
Comfrey is drawing calcium and magnesium and what have you up into its stalk and its leaves from deeper down. And when that plant is either mown or decays in the fall, those nutrients go into the topsoil right there in the fungal duff zone. So I want all kinds of taprooted plants out there in that orchard ecosystem. In permaculture, they use the term dynamic accumulators. So here's a picture of chicory. Chicory is said to bring zinc up. You know, I don't think about zinc, that rhymes. <laughs> I don't think about zinc so much as just some chicory out there is good because I know it does that, but I forget about that. But diversity is doing all these things. So I, comfrey is, is this plant that works with great with freestanding trees. Then there's nitrogen fixing shrubs. So this could be things like Siberian pea shrub or gumi berry, um, buffalo berry. These are shrubs that increase the diversity. They draw beneficial insects, but you don't want them to get so big that they take the canopy space of what your fruit trees are getting. So these are things that are coppice managed. And this can be done within the orchard context if, if you have more of a permaculture forest garden approach to what you're doing. Um, this can be done at the end of the rows, the edge of the fields. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be right next to the tree. This part is cool. Later today, I'm going to talk about endomycorrhizae, which have a relationship with 85% of the planets or so, plants on this planet. And then the fact that the trees of the forest <laughs> affiliate with what are known as ectomycorrhizae. When I showed you the feeder root and said six to eight inches, that, that's an endomycorrhizal scenario. Ectomycorrhizae actually have explorer hyphae that can reach about 12 feet beyond the root. That becomes very important, and I'll get into this later, for boring into bedrock and bringing minerals back into the plant realm. And it turns out that what are known as soft hardwoods Willow, alder, popple, soft maples in this category share a relationship with both types. They become what I call bridge trees. And so having them in the orchard environs, and maybe they're 200 feet away. You know, it's, you've, you've planted on the higher ground and now there's a wet side over here. I have an orchardist I've consulted with in New York State who has planted, this is really a neat idea. <laughs> a long block, but every four rows she put in a hedgerow of willow. And, and she planted the willows that get the contorted branches because she can sell them to florists. But she's using the willow to move sheep from block to block down the long fenced aisles, the, long, the whole volume of the, the, the orchard. And by doing that, she has the bridge trees in place in the orchard. But when she coppices it, not just to sell to the florists, that's a source of Ramiel wood chips within the orchard. But it's actually a crop as well. But, but it's tying into what the fungi do with different plants. Then there are the beneficial accumulators. So here I'm talking about all the small flowering plants that are so important for the adult form of the beneficial insect that's going to go out and lay eggs that become various little critters that eat aphids that eat caterpillars, braconid wasps. They lay their egg on a caterpillar. It eats that caterpillar. Insect allies need that um, form of adult food, the nectaries. They need a place to overwinter. Um, you know, comfrey stubble is a great place for that. Mint plants are another thing that's great for overwintering. And they also need a sense of ongoing food supply. So let me just quickly give you a little story, the story of Macrocentris. Anyone who grows apples, where you can grow peaches, probably knows the cut cousin of codling moth known as the oriental fruit moth. And oriental fruit moth um, can damage a significant portion of the stone fruit crop, and then it moves on to the apple crop. There is this native braconid called Macrocentris that can knock back as much as 85, 90% of oriental fruit moth. But you have to do certain things to really favor it. 
and it's based on what I just showed you in terms of rules. Macrocentris in the spring, if you're growing strawberries somewhere within the orchard environs, it could be cultivated, it could be wild, but strawberries get a pest known as the strawberry leaf roller. Macrocentris feeds on that, its numbers build. Now oriental fruit moth comes out and it has significant, num significant enough numbers to knock back those populations. And then if you grow sunflowers and you let the sunflowers stay through the fall and into winter, sunflowers attract a moth called the sunflower moth. Macrocentris feeds on that and then it overwinters in the, the crevices of the sunflower plant. You know, if, if you have German heritage and you feel compelled to cut everything down and make it really neat in the fall, you have to suppress that because that's where the beneficials carry over. All those Ramiel wood chips. When I talk about the pests that we face, anything from European apple sawfly, which some of you might experience if you're more to the east. Do you have that? It's coming. <laughs> Um, Cuculeo, whether it's plum cuculeo or apple cuculeo, apple maggot fly, these are all pests that have to get from the apple that they've destroyed and get into the soil to pupate. And the more you have this diverse rough understory, the more spiders you're going to have. They intercept a lot of that. Ground beetles intercept a lot of that. So there's, there's advantages to this wild and woolly look under the trees as well. This is a book put out by the Xerxes Society. Um, and it lists different flowering plants, shrub plants, hedgerow plants for all the different ecosystems of North America. It's a really valuable resource just to introduce your, you to plants you maybe didn't realize should be in that orchard ecosystem. Now this, this next picture, I really get up here and I just try to be a diplomat about different systems and I, I really respect every grower and I know it's challenging and we make different choices. But where I come from is, you know, what do those choices do to the biology, knowing everything that we talked about? And, you know, there are reasons to use chemicals and they're easily justified. And you actually alluded to this, Steve. Some of them do more harm to the soil life than others. So. If that's where you're at, you have to start learning a little bit about that because those things push things in a bacterial direction and you lose the fungal benefits that I've been trying to describe. Um, the fungal foods, the fatty acids in the sprays, all of that contributes to the fungal element, that wide plant diversity with lots of different lignans. It contributes to building that fungal ecosystem. And it's not just about mycorrhizae, it's also about the saprotrophic fungi. I always consider it an absolute badge of honor if I walk out through my orchard and I see different mushrooms popping up here and there. It, that's, that's my way of seeing this is fungal, this is, this is a good thing. And, and when you apply all these lessons, um, understanding the mineralization piece, whether it's through tissue testing, um, I, I use different foliar minerals at certain points in the season, kind of like you, and trying to identify a baseline of what do I need for my situation. That's something that you have to figure out for your specific site. Um, and these various fungal duff practices to, to grow what I think is really outrageously great fruit. And it's by working with the biology that I get there. And it influences how I do understory management, but I call it fungal duff management. And that's my story. So I, I'm going to get into more specifics on that in this practicum question and answer period tomorrow, but, but I'll tell you this. There are commercial inoculums that have nine species of endomycorrhizae and myco apply, uh, mycorrhizal applications out of Oregon um, is the leader in that. 
Then there are a number of products that have four species, and that's good. Um, then there's some products that just have the one, and that's not so good. So you have to know a little bit to be making the right choices. But I, the more species, the more diversity. They might not all lodge in your ecosystem, but they're part of the transition as things settle and become that mycorrhizal network. Okay, you know, I love the nuance questions. So if, if you can't get the brushy stuff, which is the ideal, um, and you're gonna get bark mulch, basically, whether it's chipped and shredded or not, that really wants to be that hardwood deciduous element because the tannins and softwood, as you get into the bigger stem of the tree, which is a logging operation, a lumber operation is dealing with, they also suppress growth in a big, big way. So thin bark on the ends of branches, that's different. But as you get into the thicker bark at the base of a pine or a spruce, and if that's what you're putting on exclusively, that's, that's not a soil building type thing. What that does is that creates great peat bogs. That's what happens <laughs> in where softwood grows. Back there, there was a question. So if I was planting apples, fruit trees, into that scenario, and, and I think it's a good idea, remember the picture of Ramiel wood chips and the idea of sheet mulching. I start to open up the ground where the tree is going to grow. And I, I really want that tree to have two, if not three feet, if not even verging on four feet of, of elbow room to get established. And the next picture I showed you showed some plants that come into that zone, but not a whole lot of them, but some. Um, you're, you're shifting that ecosystem. You're doing it by virtue of having a tree grow that's going to become freestanding with branches that shade that ground. That's going to change the plant scenario. But through sheet mulching or deliberately introducing certain plants that work in a little bit more of a shady environment, you're going to change that density of that, that prairie root system sod. You know, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking a lot grasses there, but, but even there, when I, when I talked about grasses and 20 times as much carbon dioxide, that was regularly mown. That, that's not the same scenario as, as growing wild and cut once or twice a year. That it's important to distinguish these nuanced aspects of everything.